We got a big one for you this week here on Talking Track, part of the big play, My Race Horse Network. Welcome on in. I'm Matt Fontana. He is Ryan Stillman, and we previewed the Breeders' Cup on our last show. Ryan, it's time now to recap the Breeders' Cup, and what a weekend it was. Exciting. Big wins for the My Race Horse team. A lot of fun. You were there and really excited to get in everything uh, and the experiences that you had out there uh, out in California. Ryan, first off, we welcome everybody into episode two here of talking track and again part of the my resource community big play we're talking nothing but horses we're talking nothing but racing and ryan we had the massive breeders cup which you got to go to and you were telling me that it was just so much fun it was so exciting to be there matt thanks so much for uh, that great tee up there because yeah this was absolutely one of those events if you were a my racehorse fan that exceeded the hype um first of all i got to shout out the people at my racehorse because i got to meet them all which was just beyond wonderful because they turn out to be fantastic people you know michael barons the ceo his wife amber uh joe moran and nick hines who pick out their horses you saw joe if you watched last week's show uh chris ransom who helps set things up behind the scenes when i need interview help hannah bloom who's incredible and uh caitlin dunn who uh i think you guys are gonna get to love meeting today yeah honestly this was one of those like trips of a lifetime uh, I'm trying to compare it because I know you guys are massive sports fans outside of this, but I don't know. It'd be like getting to know a quarterback in, b- before he debuts in college or something, and then he like goes on to win the championship in the NFL. That's kind of been my experience. I'm excited to get into this, but we have a lot to unpack. And before we go there, I do really want to shout out one major group of people that I think uh, none of this would be possible without, and that's the owners of the My Race Horse Horses. And man, I was the most moved by that. Um, getting to meet them this weekend, I saw how much these horses mean to them. And uh, Matt, it's it's just crazy because you, you get to see people that are telling you stories like, my life was totally down and out. I'm, I'm having a tough time and I just like needed something to spice it up. So I put a few bucks down into a horse And here I am at the Breeders' Cup and it's been like giving me a reason just to like wake up in the morning and be happy again. And it's gotten me into racing and my mind's in a better space. And people that were like having personal issues, like I'm taking care of my father with Alzheimer's and I'm going to just be here for two days and hope one of my horses does well. I don't know. It's just sports, man. Wouldn't you say, Matt, like how much sports brings to your life? It's just beautiful to see. It is, and especially with my racehorse where you're involved. Like, it is. You get these opportunities to go, and you're a part of it. And I think that's the best thing about my racehorse, Ryan, is that you can be involved as much as you want to be involved. And however many shares, and it, part of the show that we'll do each and every week, we've got another horse available for people to get out there and get involved with with my racehorse. And that's the journey. And like you said, we get a little piece of it. Uh, through my racehorse, but it's so great when you're able to go and understand the gravity of this and really what the Breeders' Cup being the biggest, one of the biggest events uh, of the year in thoroughbred racing. It's it's awesome. And like you said, there's varying levels. You know, there's owners there that are completely, uh, that's their horse and they're involved, but then even just for the average folk out there like us, that can be a part of it. It is so great. And, you know, my racehorse was well represented out there at the Breeders' Cup, not just by the people, but certainly a lot of the horses they had out there. Uh, but again, you you ran through that list of people that were there. And that's why for people that are interested in my racehorse or are a part of it, understand this outfit, that this organization, they have some of the top people and they have some of the best people involved in this when it comes to the horses and even events like this at the Breeders' Cup. Absolutely. And I was really grateful because Ken's really was a major part of me being able to experience that firsthand. Ken Miles, you guys probably see him all the time on Big Play Sports. Um, He he got me in person, behind the scenes, sort of access to a lot of cool stuff. I was there as a member of the media as well. I hung with the My Racehorse people all week, but... um, I think we got to show something here. What do you think, Matt? I think we can tee this up. Let's do it. Yeah. So obviously Ken was a part of it. Big out there. And here's a little piece of Ken out there at the Breeders' Cup getting us ready to go. Here we are at beautiful Del Mar Racetrack in Del Mar, California, just outside of San Diego for the 2024 Breeders' Cup Classic. Big play brings you all the inside scoop. Hi, we're at the backside over in the paddock area of the Breeders' Cup. I'm talking to legendary Jason Worth here, who was one of the owners of Dornock, who's had an incredible rivalry with our horse, Seize the Grave. Well, here we see a horse on the way from the back barns to the paddock area where every one of these horses is going to go as they change their lives and race in the biggest races of their career. Here's where the horses come to warm up before the race. Here we are on the track, where in just a few short hours, 
horses are going to compete in all the different races. And we're standing right now in the Breeders' Cup winner circle. And on the other side of it, we're looking to, you know, uh, start kind of some kind of media play with, um, you know, kind of getting spread the word of, of horse racing and getting out there to more people and, and try to try to create uh, more owners and sharing more owners. In the game. Well, you know, that's one of the things that we're doing at my racehorse. And I got to tell you, a couple times when I saw you in the paddock area, which sees the gray going against Darnock, I'm like, all right, one of us is going to win it. Bigplay.com slash horse is where you're going to find all the news. You want to see, hear that famous call, up down the stretch they come. And Big Play is going to take you right there. That's some behind the scenes stuff. Can't get anywhere else. I know Ken, Ryan, I think we have the picture of him with Jason Worth again. And obviously we know Jason Worth is a World Series winning outfielder, but it's so funny to see there's Ken and Jason yet again that this, I, I think, Ryan, it's such a big part about my racehorse and kind of where we're at. It brings so many people together. It brings so many people from different sports because I think it's all driven by what? Competitiveness, uh, being a part of the team. And I don't, I, I guess the whole thing is I don't, it's not weird to me that so many athletes find their way to race horsing or horse racing and, and, and find their way to ownership because of the competitive nature of it and the importance of this and the fun of it. Uh, it's of course, perfect that guys like Jason worth and, you know, we even talk about some bigger athletes when it comes to some of the other ideas that are out there with the thoroughbred racing league. Uh, some of the big names involved with that. It's not a shock to me when you see people like that gravitating to the sport. I think you put that perfectly. And what's really cool is, so you guys saw Jason Worth there. And um, basically, Ken's, he's got a huge share of Seize the Gray. If you watch the show, you're pretty aware of that. Ken's very proud of that, as he should be. And um, Jason Worth had the rival of one of Seize the Gray's biggest rivals. And what was really neat behind the scene, Matt, first of all, shout out to Jason, because he's super nice in person. Shook his hand, mm -hmm. met him at after parties. Really nice. But he was even rooting for Seize the Gray. It's like, He's like, if I couldn't win, I hope it was you. And, and you you could tell he was genuine. So what's really great is racing, unlike other sports, I can't walk up to LeBron James at, at a basketball game. I will be beaten up by a security card or something. I can't do that anywhere. You guys know it's just you got to have access. But these people are there at the paddock. You can walk up to them and shake their hand. I mean, man, I shook the hand of a prince this weekend, guys. It was crazy. You could walk up to these people and the My Racehorse people are accessible. So I shout out again to Ken, who you just saw got access to everything. I mean, he had us in the high roller seats, guys. It was crazy. I'm out there. Guys are like betting 10 grand on, on each race. You're like, what? Where are you getting this money from? This is crazy. Um, but yeah, it's super fun. And look, I think we need to go into some of the horses we discussed last week, especially because you can't say big play without talking about improbable luck. And he wasn't here, but we did have the half brother, Governor Sam. We did. So we'll start that on recapping some of the big interests there with my racehorse with Governor Sam. Uh, as you mentioned, the juvenile turf sprint uh, for Governor Sam, which you see there. Uh, how'd he do, Ryan? A solid showing. And there was a lot of belief that he might be able to take that down. Came up just short, though. Absolutely. Look, this is what's really crazy. I want to put this in perspective. So in the United States, you guys watch the Derby. It's all on dirt, right? When you see those horses run, it's on dirt. We have grass racing as well here. But in Europe, it's the reverse. They're mostly focused on the grass. Like, that's what they want, the turf. So when they bring over their horses, they're so much better than us, Matt. Like, their turf horses, that's all they do. They focus on breeding them. They're bred by princes, the richest of the rich. Like, we can't comprehend that money. That's who owns those horses. So American horses aren't usually able to compete against them. The half-brother to Improbable Luck, Governor Sam, he did. He did fantastic, actually. He, he finished third against the Europeans. Now, I think this is kind of promising for our horse, Improbable Luck. Um, if he is able to do well on the turf, there's a future for him there as well as dirt. And Improbable Luck's by a first crop sire, Matt. So, like, we don't know exactly what his horses are going to be good at, mm -hmm. where, where they're at. But this is the first major good horse out of Improbable Luck's dad, Improbable. And if this is any indication, I seriously wonder if Improbable Luck's going to be, like, a monster on the turf. Doesn't mean he can't take to grass, to, to uh, dirt as well. But I'm really excited for him to get his opportunity because Governor Sam showed that uh, the sky's the limit as far as the grass goes for his breeding. So I, I don't know. There could be something exciting happening here. Yeah, and you kind of mentioned it too. We were getting ready to go, and you said that really Governor Sam should be now viewed as the best 
stateside juvenile turf sprinter. Like, that's the way, if you want to compare it to, again, the Europeans who came in very strong with his showing with what we have seen, it's fair to say that Governor Sam is the best United States juvenile turf sprinter right now. There's no question he is at this minute. And it's it's just incredible. And I'm really going to compare it to this. This is how much of a deficit there is of what you're trying to do when you face the Europeans. You guys remember that like Jamaican bobsled team? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, like, oh, yeah. Uh -huh, oh, yeah. Cool runnings. Good. Good film. Great film. Great film. Right. I'm sure you enjoyed that. Um, that is what we are to the Europeans. So to finish third as the Jamaican bobsled team, it's pretty impressive. I don't know. I'm trying to think, are there other comparisons? Like, I'm sure you, you're you better with that map, but where it's just like, wow, we're just not in the same league. Well, I would say, I mean, obviously everybody say the miracle on ice, right? Like hockey, while we play it, it's really kind of more Canadian, Russian type like that. Like I would imagine if we went to go United States won cricket or something or or soccer, probably the, the, probably the best thing would be soccer is if somehow an MLS team won the Premier League. And you just know that the best teams are over there. They're always over there. Even when they do friendlies, they usually smoke us. There's not a lot of American players that play. So obviously, probably soccer is the, the one that we should go with. It would be like an upset on that kind of level. And again, it's not an upset for the fact that he won, but just that he showed out so well uh, against that stiff competition. You nailed it. That's exactly it. And it's just saying there's a lot of talent there. And uh, hopefully that's promising for improbable luck. I just think that... I just think we always have to be keeping in mind when it comes to racing, right? We all dream of like, what's this horse going to be? Is he going to be the Derby winner? Is he going to be this? And look, I'm really hoping our horse goes on and does it. I'm certainly not saying he can't, but we're going to talk about a horse next. That's a prime example of letting a horse develop into what they're meant to do and what happens when you do that. So uh, I think we should talk about our next guy. Absolutely. Here. Straight no chaser, 100% my race horse owned. And he took it down in the sprint. What was that like, Ryan, to be a part of the crew, be a part of the group and watch him take down a massive race there at the Breeders' Cup? This was maybe the coolest thing that's ever happened in racing for me. I've got to be honest. So before this race went off, um, I obviously was aware, we talked on our last week's show, that my racehorse had two horses running in the Breeders' Cup. One of them sees the gray who's like, I don't know, Patrick Mahomes. He's, he's just a rock star, right? T top eight horses in the United States coming into the Breeders' Cup. Then straight no chaser, it's like no one was really covering him. Yes, people had interviewed Dan Black or been this, but like, I reached out and Dan's a very funny guy. He's the kind of guy that should be getting Kentucky Derby horses, but doesn't get his chance. It's just, you're, he's, he's, he's an up and coming. Anyways, I called him and I'm like, Hey, I, uh, nice to meet you. And he's like, man, you must be scraping the bottom of the barrel to want to talk to me. I'm like, no, I think you have a good chance. Um, and I explained why. And he thought he thought he respected that. And I said, how much time do I have? And we spoke for an hour. I posted that interview on our website. I said this horse has a great shot. I truly believe this horse could do this. I, I think he went off as the fourth choice. He wasn't getting a ton of respect as far as like the favorite. This horse kicked ass, guys. He turned out to be the best dirt sprinter in the world. And it was crazy because honestly, I, I met the guy at the after party. <laughs> I haven't talked to him. I'm like, oh my gosh, Dan's such a great guy. And here's the thing that is so cool about my racehorse. Look. A guy like Dan needs these chances to show what he can do. My racehorse gave him that chance. He did it with this horse. And you give this horse to another barn, maybe they put him on the derby trail. Maybe they mess it around. Maybe they do this. Dan let this horse develop. He took his time, step by step, piece by piece. And they didn't rush this horse. And when he was ready at five years old, guys, they let him mature at five. He went and became the best dirt sprinter in the world. He's probably going to win a Clips Award for champion dirt sprinter. This is an incredible story. It is what my racehorse is about. You put your money down, they let the horse develop, and if it has the talent, it will reach its full potential. And that is what we saw this weekend. Yeah, John Velasquez on that ride, which was so great. That was Dan Blackers, as you mentioned, I think the first grade one win on dirt for him. And there was a little change up there with the horse kind of coming in, responded well, got it done coming down the stretch. What a win it was there for Straight No Chaser and the My Racehorse crew. We wrap it up with, again, the prize of My Racehorse right now. He sees the gray Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile 
unfortunately didn't really have it that day. That's kind of racing. That's kind of sports. That's kind of life. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't happen on that particular day. Uh, but the exciting thing for Seize the Gray, Ryan, is that he is now moving on to the next part of his journey, uh, racing career, retirement uh, on the horizon there for Seize the Gray. But, but talk about his weekend at the Breeders' Cup and also what is up uh, next for Seize the Gray. Yeah, I mean, you said that so eloquently, Matt. I think that's perfectly put. It wasn't his day, but that's okay. The point is this horse took these owners on the trip of a lifetime. I mean, look, he won a race on the undercard of the Kentucky Derby. How cool is that? Like people went to the Kentucky Derby and got to stand in a winner's circle on the same day of the race. He won the Preakness Stakes. He won the Pennsylvania Derby, and he had a chance to be a champion in this game. You can't really ask for more. The bottom line is he was an iron horse. He ran so hard, and possibly at the end of his campaign, he's tired. He had done enough. Um, his next step is to Gainesway Farm, where he's going to be a stallion. He wound up being the people's horse. And what was really cool was going to the racetrack and everywhere you went. I'm serious. People had seized the gray hats on, seized the gray swag. It was just, I don't know. It was amazing. And I'm I'm looking forward to his future. He's a very valuable stallion. Um, he's. I think he's the winningest son of his dad. And his dad was like, if this sport was gymnastics, his dad was like Simone Biles. Like mm. he's that caliber and his, he passed away. So this is a very exciting horse. Like maybe he'll turn out to be a great sire. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm excited actually speaking of the swag too. I just, I'm excited with our guests. We have a lot to talk about with that, but we'll get to that in a sec. I'm sure. But yeah, this, sometimes you, you can't win them all, but when you're the people's horse, you kind of win their hearts and that does count for something. Now. Well, especially you know? being a big part of my race horse, because now a lot of people, when you get involved, you're excited about the races and obviously you want to win that money, but also there's a, there's that second wave. And and just because sees the gray is no longer going to race. doesn't mean that your investment is not going to continue or that your involvement is not going to continue because there's money to be had in, like you said, the sires, stallions fees, all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the things my racehorse is year over year investment. It's something that you're involved with. I shouldn't say year over year investment. You make your one-time investment, but you are personally invested for years to come. And just because his racing career is over does not mean his story is done. And there's still plenty of things. Uh, if you weren't a part owner or a part of my uh, Seize the Gray with my racehorse that you're going to be involved in for years to come as well. Just because the racing's over doesn't mean it's done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, by the way, that was kind of cool because I got to really know some of these owners. And like, for example, the straight no chaser owners. I don't remember. I don't want to quote this wrong, but like, let's let's just make a number of like 127. It's like I I put down for 127 for this horse. They already made all their money back. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so they've had five years with this horse. They're standing in a Breeders' Cup winner's circle and they they now get to say they own a champion. So it's exactly the same thing there. And that's I don't know, man, for bang for your buck. That's a good bet, especially in racing where you can just put that money down and never see a return on your investment. Here you are with a champion. So Absolutely. It's, it's so it's awesome. That's one of the things we love about my race source. It's opening up to a lot of different people. We want to speak to a different person now because Caitlin Dunn, Ryan's going to sit down with her. She obviously is very involved with things. My race source because her dad was one that was involved with training Seize the Gray uh, before he uh, got into racing, obviously his career. So Ryan's going to sit down with Caitlin and talk my race source sees the gray and kind of his future. So here's Ryan sitting down with Caitlin Dunn. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive interview with Caitlin Dunn. She works at My Racehorse. If you're a My Racehorse fan, you know her. You see her everywhere. It's astonishing. I had the pleasure to meet her at the Breeders' Cup, but she honestly became quickly one of my favorite people I've ever got to meet in racing. She's just knowledgeable, smart, young, funny, and we couldn't have had a better guest on our show today. So Caitlin, thank you so much for coming today. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited to be here. Why don't we talk about some of the great horses that have come through your dad's program? Yeah, for sure. So um, it's a really it's a really fun program. Um, you know, we have about 150 to 200 horses a year. So with numbers like that, you know, a few of them are going to pop off and kind of become some big ones. Um, our goal is always to sell them at auction. And when they don't, you know, make it through or they are in a, you know, they don't meet the reserve price, we end up keeping them and we go ahead and race them. So it's kind of like our little band of misfits. How do you wind up at my racehorse and what would you say your role is there? That's another, that's another question. Um, question. Um, so we, I was down in Florida finishing up my master's program, uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, and I was working for a pharmaceutical company for a guy named Bob Edwards, who has E5 racing. And I just wanted to see a career outside of racing to make sure racing was really what I wanted to do. And it definitely showed me like, okay, racing is for me. My boyfriend, Riley, 
uh, now my fiance, he had told me, hey, my friend works at my racehorse. She works in marketing. Do you want me to text her and see? And I was like, oh, my racehorse, like, they're so cool. Like, they won the Derby. Like, I don't think, I don't think they'd have a place for me. Like, I just thought they were this giant corporation, you know, that it would be really hard to kind of get in touch with them. And um, yeah, I reached out to to his buddy. And next thing you know, I kind of came in as the events manager. When you talk about my racehorse and your connection with it, this to me, Caitlin, I mean, would you say it's fair to say it's been a pretty uh, monumental moment in my racehorse as far as this year goes with winning a Preakness and a Breeders' Cup? This year was just so special because these two horses were owned completely by my racehorse. So it was all of this hard work that our bloodstock team puts in and placing the horses in the right spots and the patience of the trainers and everybody that's, you know, believed in us and been a part of that journey. I definitely feel like it actualized us as being real, real competitors in this game. What was your Breeders' Cup experience like? Like, what were your thoughts on this year's Breeders' Cup? For sure. And first off, hats off to our Bloodstock team, Joe Moran and Nick Hines, who picked Straight No Chaser and placed him with Dan Blacker. And all of the patience that Dan has had with this horse was heavily rewarded. Um, for me, so Straight No Chaser is a West Coast horse. I work primarily on the East Coast. Um, so a little bit different. I didn't have a personal connection with the horse. Obviously, you love them all. You know, they're all a part of the My Race Horse family. What was it like to see that horse win? Yeah, it's it's huge and it was scary because I was like, we've had so many conversations with Breeders' Cup. How is this going to go? You know, how many people are going to be there? And we base it all off of who enters our lotteries. So we knew that the you know, the interest was high. A lot of people were going to be coming out. And even though Straight No Chaser has a more modest ownership group with around 800 owners, that's still 800 people, you know? So if everyone came out, I don't know if Del Mar has a big enough winner circle for that. Um, so we were really trying to gauge it. And I know Breeders' Cup was scared of us, you know? So they were kind of like, I don't know how many people are going to come. And it's funny, I actually couldn't see the race from where I was standing. I was standing behind the winner circle because I was like, on the off chance that he wins, I need to be there first to make sure that security like has help and has support. And um, I was standing and I remember I was just like kind of standing to the side and listening to the race call. And all of a sudden I hear, in straight no chaser is making a move on the outside. And I was like, oh my God, it's really happening. Like this is, he is gonna win this thing. So I looked at um, Olivia Hills who works for Breeders' Cup and she does all the horsemen's relations. And we're just locking eyes as like, we're, neither of us are watching the race and we're just like locked in. And he wins and my eyes just blow and she goes, get here now. And so I remember I ran to the entrance of the winner's circle and I was like, okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they were like, okay, like we just have to be the really organized. Like we'll do one with the you know horse coming in and then another photo once the horse is left. I was like, got it. And they were like, but we have a musical performance in here after. So they need to be quick. And I'm watching uh, Dora who is like, one of the super high ups at Breeders' Cup and Drew Fleming, who's the um, the CEO of Breeders' Cup, they're watching the mass of people just start coming to this gate. And they're like, you can't, you can't get them all in. I was like, yes, we can. We've done it before. Trust me, they can do it. And they were like, okay, but they like, they have to be calm. So I remember kind of felt like a, bra like a Black Friday sale. Like I went over and I was like, if anyone runs into the winner's circle, you're not getting your picture taken, but I'm so happy for you guys, yay. And like, we were all just like cheering and happy, but I was also like, please be safe, don't push each other. So everyone came in and it was amazing. We had one big picture with anyone that had like a paddock pass and the trainer's family and jockey's family, horse leaves, they do the trophy presentation. And then we brought everybody else in. Anybody that was there for straight no chaser that was behind the winner's circle, they got in, they got their picture taken, and then they got out, they did the musical performance, and off we went. So it was it was just really cool. Everyone got their moment, and that's the biggest thing. Like it wouldn't have felt like we won if anybody, if everybody couldn't have gone in and done that to me personally. You know what I mean? I just want them all to be able to like have they're the owners. We wouldn't have been able to have that horse if they didn't buy the shares. So they all deserve a spot in the winner circle, even if there's two hundred or three hundred, right? So it was it was really, really cool. Definitely a little stressful, but cool. <laughs> <laughs> you can't talk about a horse that's impacted people more than Seize the Gray. And we're going to get into it right now because you have a pretty special connection with him. So talk about Seize the Gray and when you first saw him. Oh, man. Seize the Gray. He is, he is so special to me for so many reasons. Um, he is the coolest dude. But 
it was really fun, you know, when our team bought him at the sale, I was at that sale, um, you know, I was still pretty fresh in my racehorse at that time, um, but I had somehow convinced Michael to send the yearlings to my dad. I was like, my dad will, you know, do the tours, he'll do the updates on camera, all the things. I don't know if my dad knew he was getting volunteered for all of this, but I knew it was just going to be a really cool experience to get to bring people out. So people could meet all of these, all these youngsters. And um, I remember he got to the farm and he was there. I think we had six yearlings that year. We had a pretty big group. Um, and he was, <laughs> Cecil Gray was definitely like the short little pudgy kid of the class. And he just kind of, he was super calm, lazy in, I don't know. He wasn't a standout for any reason, but it's one thing my dad always says. It's like the ones that aren't the standout, the ones that just do what they're told and kind of go through the program. You know, if you don't hear about them, that's a good thing. You know, like that's kind of our our motto. And I don't know. We got to a point where like he wasn't growing, like he wasn't getting tall. He was just getting wide. And we were like, oh, my God, he's like he's just going to stay like this little pony. And then all of a sudden he hit this growth spurt and he started kind of putting the, you know, the pieces together mentally and physically and I remember dad told me, he was like, this is the perfect horse for Wayne. Cause this horse is not like rattled by anything. He's easygoing. He be, he's okay with shipping. Like he's just smart. He has this, you know, kind of way, way about him. Um, but he was definitely the star of the show. Like on the tours, he was everyone's cuddle bug. Like I was like, if anybody wants to ride him, they can, he's easy, you know, <laughs> not actually, but, um, you know, people were just draped over him and he, he loved it. He's always loved being in the, in the spotlight. So Caitlin, it's been a pleasure to get to talk to you and yeah, uh, looking forward to more interviews in the future, hopefully, cause you're just a delight. So thank you. Hey, thanks Ryan. This was amazing. That was great stuff there just on Seize the Gray. Really his journey and kind of where we go from here, Ryan, with him. It, it, like you said, and I, it's a bad pun and I apologize. It's been a, a fun ride. It's been a hell of a ride uh, there with Seize the Gray. And that's the fun thing about my racehorse. You've got uh, horses that you know, but then it's also about that next wave of horses, which we'll get to in just a second here on Talking Track. But uh, really great insight there on Seize the Gray and where things kind of go from there. Yeah, she's lovely. I got to meet her in person and I just... Again, what's really wonderful is the group of people they've cultivated there. They're not just great at what they do. They're very, very kind and approachable. And you got to see that with Caitlin. I mean, she's a rock star. Yep. Well, obviously, we talk about a lot of the big horses here. And I know people, Ryan, are sitting there watching. Well, I would have liked to have gotten involved in that horse early. Things sell out quick. But one of the big parts that we do here on the show is going to bring you another horse available that you can get at my race source. And our heart, our horse spotlight of the week this week is going to be a horse named Real Savvy. Uh, tell everybody about that. Tell them about the win as well, uh, which is exciting about the Real Savvy. Savvy. Yeah, I mean, Real Savvy is a pretty exciting horse. So I just had to talk about this because I actually think there's a bright future for this horse somewhere. Um, he won his first race on his third try at Belmont, and this was the day after the Bre Breeders' Cup ended, so Sunday. And I got to be honest, he kicked this field's behinds, bro. I mean, they, th this was a four and a quarter length win, and he's trained by uh, Christophe Clement, who's a great trainer. Um, and I just... If you watch this horse go, and I, I look for the replay online, it's incredible. You can just see this horse accelerates. He pulls around the turn fast. And I just think, I think we could be looking at a, a little bit of a rising star. He reminds me, honestly, of Straight No Chaser, like that level of talent, what we're seeing a little bit early. And I, I think... I think my racehorse has another good one, guys. Yeah, and that's the exciting thing of the horses over and over again, that ones are going to be there. So real savvy ones to watch. Some up, other ones that are up and available to my racehorse. You can go to Spanx, a million, Malibu, Bonnie, and Elite Heat are some of the horses available right now uh, for that purchase. Again, the best thing about my racehorse, there's so many different things. There are many different price points, so many different horses that you can check out. So we tell everybody, head over to MyRacehorse.com, download the app, and get yourself acquainted with everything uh, going and the excitement around that. Ryan, I'm so glad you had a lot of fun uh, out there at the Breeders' Cup, man. It sounded awesome. And that's the other thing about my racehorse. That's attainable to you out there. You know, like Ryan was saying, some of the people we're meeting were average people that got involved. They get the opportunity to go. And like you said, you click on it, you get into a horse. All of a sudden, Ryan, who knows, you're standing in the winning circle there uh, at the Breeders' Cup, which is just awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's that's all the fun there. You could have the next Real Savvy. You could have the next Straight No Chaser. You could have the next Seize the Gray. And um it's just exciting that there's a lot more coming up. 
I've heard some rumblings about some very exciting horses that, that are training out there in the weeds, man. Um, and even guys like Caldero who lost that last race, I'm still hearing some good stuff and there's no shame in losing. Sees the gray ran worse in his debut than Caldera did. So it's an f- exciting year coming up, especially with the Kentucky Derby trail ahead of us. Absolutely. And we're going to get into all that on future episodes as we run through it. So again, we appreciate everybody joining us here on Talk and Track. Uh, again, check out MyRacehorse.com. You can always go to BigPlay.com slash horse uh, for any involvement for, again, buying a horse, seeing the merch, just kind of keep it updated. And of course, we appreciate everybody tuning into our show this week. He's Ryan Stillman. I'm Matt Fontana. This has been Talk and Track.